Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. We've done over 670 of them now. If this is new to you and you'd like to check out some of the previous ones, please go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu, where you'll see them organized in several different ways. This program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there's a PayPal button on the website, and there's a page explaining alternatives to PayPal. Um, my guest today is Neil Douglas Klotz. He is an internationally known scholar in the fields connecting religious studies, comparative Sem Semitic hermeneutics. Hey, Neil, what does that mean? <laughs> hermeneutics is based on the name of Hermes, the Greek god. Of, uh -huh. And Hermes, uh, the, tr the tradition of Hermes is that language can, can heal you or language can kill you. So he was the trickster. And so hermeneutics is the big language, the scholar's word. It's a language for the whole interpretation theory around languages. Okay, so in other words, you studied uh, comparison between various interpretations of the Semitic languages. That's right, that they shared a common worldview and they shared a common way of looking at life, which I okay. can speak about later. Okay, good. And uh, Aramaic is one of those languages, I presume. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So um, you were uh, you're an internationally known scholar in the fields connecting that um, and psychology, as well as a poet and musician. You are the author of Prayers of the Cosmos, um, Desert Wisdom, The Hidden Gospel, uh, The Genesis Meditations. Um, as well as co-author of The Tent of Abraham with Sister Joan Chittister and Rabbi Arthur Waskow. Um, you're also the author of a, a new book, Revelations of the Aramaic Jesus, which we'll be talking about today. You are the past chair of the Mysticism Group of the American Academy of Religion and, an active, and are active in various international colloquia and conferences dedicated to peace and spirituality. Um, one of your mentors is Sheikh Fadlala Hariri, whom I interviewed on Batgap about a year and a half ago. Delightful man. Um, and I want to read a quote from your website before we get rolling, because I liked it a lot. Um, it is a real blessing if one can find companions on the path with whom one can share honestly and who are dedicated to the awakening of self to soul through the constant, albeit often painful, massaging of the heart by life's circumstances. When well massaged, any pain of rigidity, the awe of life, is superseded by the awe of the soul's eyes looking through one's own. There we go. Um, so I'd like to ask you just if we could spend a few minutes. Um, some people are pretty self-effacing. They want to talk about themselves a lot. But I always like to um, give people a glimpse of who the person is that they're going to be hearing for the next hour or two uh, because one wants to know on what authority or uh, based on what study or knowledge or experience the person is saying the things they're saying and uh, so give us a bit of your background okay well anyway thanks for inviting me rick sure um <clears throat> it's, been, it's been an enjoyable week um you know reading your book and just thinking about the things that you've been discussing i I'm going to have a lot of fun today. Uh, I hope everybody enjoys this. Right. <laughs> Everything you want to know and didn't want to know about Jesus. So. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> anyway. We're afraid to ask. And yeah, that's it's exactly right. And most people are are afraid. Um, <clears throat> With good reason. <laughs> For good reason. Yeah, I, you get I burned agree. at the stake. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, as I... You know, I was born in a sort of alternative family in a suburb of, of Chicago, Illinois, and uh, my father was one of the early chiropractors in Illinois. So my two brothers and I were raised with, uh, we were raised with what I call the Holy Trinity of Edgar Cayce, you know, the American psychic, and Rachel Carson, of course, the great American ecologist, and then chiropractic. So, I mean, I could spell chiropractic before anyone else in my school even knew what it was. <laughs> I'll tell you that. So we had this inner family sort of culture. 
And uh, as most children do, I thought everyone lived that way until I started to go to school and then discovered that it's not the case. So, so we had to have, as I now call it, we had our inner family story, um, which didn't involve any theology, really. My parents were raised Christians, but they mainly read us Bible stories at night. Uh, they didn't, you know, they weren't fussed about that. But we needed an outer cover story, as I now call it, in our community. My father did, we did, I suppose, because he had to work there and it was quite conservative. So um, my brothers and I were sent to a uh, quite conservative Christian elementary school. Um, this was Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, if any of your listeners know what that was about or is about. They, they, they softened up a bit after that, but we had to learn uh, large parts of the King James Bible by heart and all of Luther's catechism by heart and all of Luther's theology by heart and you know, I think it was, it was the Lutherans that Gary Garrison Keeler was always going on about, right? On he, Prairie he Home Companion. Yeah, he, yeah, Garrison Keeler's <laughs> good on Lutherans, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, these were, uh, yeah. So anyway, you know, that, that did serve me, but because uh, <clears throat> I, I still remember large parts of the Bible, obviously. Uh, but when I, when I finally sort of exited all of that and made it to university, I went as far away from Christianity as I could. And I basically became involved uh, as an investigative reporter uh, in the anti-war movement. And because I had a background in it, then in the Food and Drug Administration, investigations of the Food and Drug Administration and, you know, the adulteration of drugs and all of this stuff. So that's what I originally started working as was a consumer investigative reporter in New York City. Um, and I wanted to, I mean, I'm, you know, you wanted to know the background. This is where I came to how I'm doing it. But, um, <clears throat> you know, I had an editor in New York City, uh, one of the bigger consumer publications, and he liked my work, but he said, Neil, you know, this is all too positive. You know, you have to make people more afraid because <laughs> if they're afraid, they'll buy more of the, more of the magazine. This is all pre-internet, you understand, Rick. Uh, this is, this is all um pre-reagan actually too as far as that goes so in those days the u.s still had excuse me for saying so somewhat of a free press and it took the form of alternative newspapers and magazines and university and college newspapers all across the country and i ended up working for an alternative news service that syndicated stories to all this this huge network that was active in the uh well, it was, was in the late 70s and the early 80s. And I was one of the investigative reporters. So, uh, however, I was reading, you know, working 60, 70 hours a week, as you do in your 20s, uh, this was happening. So, I, you know, I read a, a poll, a Gallup poll, and it asked people, you know, as Gallup polls used to do, or these opinion polls do, you know, they would say, for instance, the poll I was reading said, Given that there's no solution to the to the problem of nuclear waste, uh, is nuclear energy a viable solution for our energy? Uh, and 70% of the sample said no. And then about 50 questions later, they asked people, if you had to give up something because we no longer had nuclear energy, would you be willing to do it? And the same percentage said no. So, this I should have known, but I was somewhat idealistic and naive, and I had a, you know, an early burnout in my mid to late twenties, and uh, and then I had to decide for myself, you know, Neil, you know, how do you make decisions in life? Do you may always make it on the basis of facts, or do you make it on the basis of something else, major life decisions? And if it's something else, what is that something else? How do you make decisions? And that led to this sort of inner search that I went on, I would say, um, which would now be called, I suppose, a sort of spiritual search, really. And, uh, you know, I went to various groups. I wasn't really satisfied uh, with anything that was happening there. And then I did end up with the Sufis. Um, and the Sufis were broad enough, at least at that point, they weren't so institutionalized, 
that you could you could you could go your own way, really. Um, you could try to integrate whatever wisdom you could find from wherever you could find it, and that was important to me. Now, because I had, and I'll finish this story because it takes you to where we can jump off from. Because I had editing skills and I had worked professionally, which few people in the hippie generation had, actually, in some cases, um, I was put to work. Uh, archiving and editing the diaries of the person who started the dances of universal peace, Samuel L. Lewis. And in his diaries, in his letters, he says, I want to do two things before I die. I want to start the dances of universal peace so people can eat, pray and dance together. And that's my peace plan. And then I also want to learn to pray the Lord's prayer in Aramaic. And he had done the first, but he had not done the second. And that was a moment that struck me. I still remember them. I still can recall the moment, you know, right now. It's just like it stopped me in my tracks. And I knew that if this, if this was something, it would have something to do with sound, uh, with feeling, um, with the connection of music and sound through the words, which is what the Sufis do and what most Middle Eastern chanted, all the Middle Eastern traditions have chanting. So they all do this. And so I began to hunt around. I began to investigate. Okay, who knew Aramaic? Who can help me? Who can do, you know? I didn't think it was that difficult because I had been raised hearing different languages anyway in my household. Part, you know, a little bit of German, a little bit of Polish, a little bit of Russian, mostly English, of course. But, you know, I had a sort of, had a sort of ear for language. And I figured, okay, well, you know, how hard could it be? So this is where I began to, you know, to chase down Aramaic, really. Hmm. Um, is Aramaic, do they, in, with Sanskrit, um, it's considered that, um, the sound value of words is as important as their meaning. And, and in fact, it's considered that there's a correlation between the vibratory quality of the name for something and that thing. So in other words, whatever the word for apple may be in Sanskrit, that somehow that word has a vibra the sound of that word has a vibratory qual quality, which in some way corresponds to the vibratory quality of an apple. Do they have something like that in Aramaic? Absolutely. You know, actually, Rick, I would say that most an ancient languages have this. And if they've survived into today, that has sort of been sieved out of them, winnowed out of them, this, this way of looking at life. The ancient Semitic languages, and here I'm talking about, you know, ancient Hebrew, Egyptian, Old Canaanite, Babylonian, Aramaic, and even up until the classical Muhammad, the classical Arabic of Muhammad, the, the Arabic that Muhammad was speaking before they, they made up grammar around it. Um, all of these have this idea. Or you, you could say they, they arise from a nomadic experience, a nomadic experience of peoples in this area of the world, Southwest Asia, I think we can now call it, or the Middle East, as we used to call it, traveling, 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 always moving. And so all of the, the languages arise out of this where the sound, the, the letters are sounds, and the letters and sounds are not just naming things that are outside of oneself, but they are making a relationship to those, they they are they are they are acknowledging a link that already exists between myself, say, and the apple, or myself and the tree. So it wasn't like I'm here and the tree's there, and you know, isn't that a nice tree? And oh, the poor tree, or or you know, it's going to be a piece of lumber someday, or whatever. It's not no, it's like I feel that the tree is part of myself, and there the b tree is like a being that is not just the physical, what we call the material object, but it is, you could say the, you could call it the spirit, the fairy, the genius. I mean, all of these words are used in different world traditions. It is the, the living, the deva of the tree in some of the Sanskrit traditions. This was not just people making up mythology in those days. This is the way they perceived outer reality. Their outer reality was like a dream life that, that, that was on the outside, as one author once put it. And I think that's a good way to look at it. The inner sense of the subconscious that we have today, my dream life is my dream life, my emotional life is my emotional life. Okay, that, that evolved over thousands of years. 
Before, we didn't have this sort of inner outer separation as much as now. The individual self was not so developed. Mm. And it would seem, based on what you just said, that a language in which there's a correlation between name and form, um, or between sound of words and the objects they represent, would um, enliven the relationship with those objects. I think you were just kind of saying that, but you know, by yes. through chanting or even just speaking a word, you're um, you're kind of creating a, a fundamental mutuality between yourself and the object. Yes, and it you know either the object or the person, for instance, who said the words. Like let's say it's a shaman or a mystic or a prophet or someone like that, a holy person. You know, if you are chanting or chanting is usually what was used around world cultures, chanting or speaking those words, you could, through the language and through a feeling of, for better, lack of better words, we would call devotion or love, you can make a connection with or through that person. And this is, I think, one of the keys of chanting, really. Yeah. In in the Gita, there's some verse about um, through yagya, which is a form of, you know, ritualistic chanting, one enlivens the, the gods or the devas, and they, in turn, benefit you. There's this mutual sort of... That's right. ...reinforcement thing going on. Um, yeah, there's a mutu I, there's a mutuality. So it's not just, oh, praise Jesus, you know, right. Jesus is up there and how wonderful... The, the way it's it's meant to open a channel if you will so there's it's a two-way street if you will there's a communication both ways yeah, yeah. there's one person once person one said you know if you if you if you believe in angels you're saved but if you actually see them you're you're probably cursed so you know it's like it's a why two would you things. be cursed well you know you know because it's not acceptable theologically to, oh i see you might get in trouble yeah <laughs> you get in trouble yeah yeah no, I have friends who who see them, a few friends anyway, and uh, well, people do, and, sure. and they keep it quiet. You know, they're they're not going and. In fact, one yeah. friend, um, when I found out that he saw these things, um, I, I was in an elevator uh, in the San Francisco airport, and he had told me uh, that he sees them, and I said, you know, are there any in this elevator? And <laughs> and he didn't really say much, but when we got off, he said, they just said to me, don't point us out to people. If they're meant to see us, they'll see us. By the way, right. there were three, he said. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, now, now you know, uh, so-called modern science poo-poos all this stuff, Rick. But, I mean, how much do we really understand about most of the way the universe works? Not much. Um, I mean, we know a lot. We but, you know. How much do we actually understand about the way the so-called uh, algorithms that control the stock market and the economy work? I mean, this is... These are these are robots, basically, and you know they're determining people's futures in some ways. So, I mean, we we put our trust in the economy or this or the markets, but what is what does it actually mean? I mean, honestly. Yeah. Um, wasn't there some Bible verse about not stocking up on all the things of the world because you know they're going to turn to dust or whatever, and you can't take them with you? I mean. I'm, well, I mean, you know, the most verse, of the but... traditions do say this. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's. Yeah. Uh, but you know, we're we're living. Well, I don't want to. You know, we can we can go. You can rant a little bit if you want. We can to. ramble. I rant a bit. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're, we're a couple of old hippies. We can blow off some steam. <laughs> human consciousness evolved in such a way that we have a much more individual human self. That's where I was going before. We're much more separated from each other, from nature, and. Also, we're much more deluded by the idea that only outer reality, so-called material reality, exists. Those are the two big delusions of modern life. They did not exist two, five, hundred thousand years ago. They had other delusions, most likely other challenges. So we've evolved in that way. You could say it's a devolution in some ways. We've evolved in the sense of individual human rights. Uh, this is an evolution of human Called of human consciousness, but along with that goes with its more individuality, this more separateness. And so now our question is, what are we going to do with this separateness? Uh, one of the things Jesus came, coming at a sort of cusp at the time when this is really starting to change, Yeshua in his Aramaic name, Yeshua came to show us, okay, how to make this, this shift in a healthy way 
so that we don't end up, well, basically sort of where we are. Not that everyone is there, but mostly what the news reports is the results of, you know, more selfie, selfish, sort of isolated, uh, materially hypnotized culture. Yeah. I've interviewed a lot of people who are trying to overturn the par the materialist paradigm, you know, which is that everything is fundamentally material and the brain creates consciousness and so on. Yes. And yes. Um, I'm sure you're aware they they are up against a lot of blowback from academic institutions and so on. And, you know, uh, whether they're a student in them or a faculty in them, they, it threatens their their career course um, and their tenure and so on if they start talking that way. So there's there's a lot of resistance to um, seeing life from a more spiritual perspective. It's, it's a wrench for people because there's so much invested in all of this, whether in academia, in technology, the scientific community, all of, even in the spiritual community, you have a lot of an equivalent sort of thing going on, actually, where people mistake the symbols of spirituality for, you know, actually anything real. <laughs> you know, instead of the emperor with no clothes, you have the clothes with no emperor, basically, in, in many cases. So what we were just what you were just saying kind of reminded me of the issue of polarization that's rending society these days and um isn't there some verse in the bible where jesus says something about i, I came to pit you know son against father or some, some such thing and it sounds like he was advocating uh polarization or separating the sheep from the goats or something you know what i'm talking about that verse well yeah i know which he's he's really talking about um in modern terms, uh, the need to get over one's conditioning from one's family mm -hmm. and from one's culture. And in the time of Yeshua, Jesus, um, the family culture for most people was pretty bleak. These were all underclass people, as we would now call them, who had been oppressed, um, taxed into penury and slavery, basically, uh, by empires for generations. And so in, in these types of families, a lot of dysfunction appears. Uh, what we would now call, you know, there, people were living under this trauma, and so they would have all these, what we would now call in psychology, liminal disorders, dissociative states, abuse, all of this was going on. And, um, and a lot of, well, most of what Yeshua's healings were about was showing people, okay, there is another, there is another realm, there is another dimension or other dimensions in the unseen, but here are ways to access them in a healthy way. You've had this, this conditioning, so to speak, abuse, whatever. I mean, you have to understand that at the time of Yeshua, uh, there was virtually no middle class. It was all, you know, even a, maybe even a smaller upper class than what there is today and as unimaginable as that may be and so you know the the local ruler he could just come you know if, say well now you owe this and if you can't pay it i'll take your son or i'll take your daughter you know and and it's, and it's like that and you know what is the effect of that on on a on a family or you know on a son or on a daughter so he's pointing out okay you have to at this point separate from that Maybe you can go back and heal it later, but you have to separate from that. Okay, so let's shift into our discussion of the book. We're already sort of doing it, but let's shift a little bit more. Sure. Um, firstly, let's establish that Jesus actually existed. Have you ever read the books by Tim Freak and Peter Gandy about whether or not you know Jesus even existed? And they cobble, they they kind of reference all these traditions which tell similar stories as we're told around the life of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. What do you make of that? I have to read all this stuff, actually, because <laughs> people are always asking about it. Um, I don't put much, much. What, here's a couple of things. Um, if Jesus did not exist, uh, he wouldn't appear all over the Quran, uh, unless you believe the conspiracy theory that the Quran is just a, a Christian aberration, which is another conspiracy theory. I mean, you can sell books with these things, but there's there's no reliability to it. I mean, these sayings, this type of wisdom, 
whether it's Jesus or Bhagavad Gita or Gautama Buddha, people don't make this stuff up by committee. I mean, it just doesn't happen. This happens when individual people open themselves in a deep way to whatever that is, the great mystery, and something begins to come through them. Later, it gets made into a religion. Later, it gets made into a religion. That's the whole story, you know, of all these, of all these uh, so-called great religions. Yeah, no, I agree. And, um, and then when it gets made into a religion, it s soon begins to, res to fail to resemble what the guy who established it was actually saying, unfortunately, yeah. and we'll yeah. get into that. Um, yeah. You know, and eventually becomes, in many cases, the polar opposite of what he was advocating. I mean, I've sure. seen you know memes on the internet of Jesus holding a, a AR-15, you know, with love. Absolutely. And, you know. <laughs> I mean, look what's happening with Buddhists in Myanmar. Yeah, yeah. Um, or you know, in the certain Hindu nationalism in India. Mm -hmm. You can go on and on with this, and of course, doing we didn't have to mention Islam. So. Yeah, my. I was a student of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and on this topic, he used to say, knowledge crumbles on the hard rocks of ignorance. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we've established the existence of Jesus. We won't debate that. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, yeah. Somebody made a splash back there. I mean, wow. Somebody made a splash. Yeah. Um, exactly. Um, so when was anything first written down? I mean, he, he obviously wasn't followed around by a stenographer, and uh, and there are accounts of private meetings he had with, like, the woman at the well and various other instances where nobody else was there. Nobody um, was there, I know. <laughs> so who, who, how did this stuff, you know, come to us? And, and when was anything first written, and did it go through decades of, you know, oral transmission before it went into print? The I'm going to put my scholarly hat on here, Rick, mm -hmm. even though I'm not changing my hat, is that this... This is the stuff the dreams are made of. No, this is the stuff that PhDs are made of in the religious studies and biblical studies field. The so-called transmission history of the Gospels. How does it go from Jesus' mouth to whatever was written down on the page? Did it, for instance, go through various people make scribbling little notes here in different places? Or did it, uh, and then did people compile these different notes? Or was there some source document? Or did it simply result from people's memory? Because we know in non-literate cultures, memory is much, much better uh, than it is in, in literate cultures. That's true. From, you know, anthropological studies. So the different so-called gospels, perhaps they simply arise from different, different groups' remembrances. Well, we remember him saying this. And then Thomas' group says, well, no, we remember him saying this. And the Mary Magdalene group says, well, we, were, we remember this. So, and it goes on like that. So, you know, my point with, with most of this is that, you know, if you look at all of them together, if you look at them through an Aramaic lens, that is through a native language lens, a native Semitic lens, it, it, it's still the same Jesus, really. It's still the same Yeshua. Just different people remember different things because we're human and we need different things. I mean, look, if you go to your spiritual teacher or any, you go to any spiritual teacher and you ask 10 people, what did you remember from that? They'll give you 10 things. And this is even given, you know, that we have much poorer memory than, than people did 2,000 years ago. Yeah, so. that's an interesting point that we have much poorer memory. And um, I don't think that point has ever come up on BatGap before, but that's that's recognized in other cultures too. Um, you know, for instance, for th for thousands of years the vedas were just handed down orally and they weren't yeah. they weren't distorted i mean and they had these very elaborate methods of memorization they had to sure. do them forwards and backwards and you know this way and that and um people devoted their lives to that and then finally when we entered what the hindus call kali yuga Ve uh, veda vyasa came along and said oh everybody's really going to get foggy now so we better write write it down so he kind yeah. of got the whole thing written down <laughs> it, it was it was the same with these these texts i mean whether is the so-called hebrew scripture or the gospels or things like this so the earliest there's diff, you know it's it's in pieces but if we boil it down to what we have today um the earliest uh, greek version is only about a hundred years 
older than the earliest Aramaic version. And if you consult the Aramaic Christian scholars on this, they say that's because we never kept old manuscripts. You know, we, we didn't want them to get too old, too frayed, so we ritually recopied them, checked them, and then burned the old one. So mm -hmm. we didn't keep the, we, we were not, a, we were never, they're, 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 nomad, they're basically nomads. You know, they don't keep old things, they, they keep fresh things. And they don't carry around old stuff with them just because it becomes a relic or, you know, <laughs> John the Baptist thumbnail or God knows what. Yeah. You know, that's, that's not, wasn't the way that it was done. So the Aramaic Christian scholars, they say, well, you know, if or when he spoke anything, he spoke it in Aramaic and our version, you know, is going to be a lot closer than any Greek version. And that's the sort of the point of view I go from. So did Aramaic, um, in terms of it being written down, did yep. Aramaic precede Greece or Greek, or was it kind of simultaneous? Different people were writing it down in their respective languages. I would say it was simultaneous, really. Okay. Because uh, Aramaic, again, most of all of Jesus's listeners were Aramaic speakers. Right. You know, again, remember, poor underclass. Um, only a few of them would have understood Greek or Latin if they were collaborators with the Romans, and that would be a a very, very small minority of people. So, Were there many Greeks hanging around in Jesus' vicinity, or was it mostly Romans speaking It was Roman, but the Romans, would, the Romans would have spoken Greek, too, okay. Okay. because it's a sort of a, it's a trade language. It's a, you could say, a language of commerce also right. at the time. But, um, but Aramaic is a very, very old language in the Middle East. It's most likely that when... If you remember your Bible at all, <laughs> I don't know how much you remember, oh, but when the, the ancient pieces. Hebrew people were carried into captivity by the Assyrians, by the Babylonians, all this stuff, when they came back, when those who came back came back, they were speaking Aramaic rather than ancient, ancient Hebrew. So, you know, the Hebrew that they were spoke, speaking before. The people who still speak a form of so-called ancient Hebrew, not modern Hebrew, are the Samaritans. Uh, who live in Israel and other parts of the Middle East, they were the ones who were left behind. So uh, when the, these other people were carried off by the empires in the, uh, what was it, the 4th, 5th, 6th centuries BCE. So they, they maintain that older, they say they maintain that older pronunciation, really. Now, I heard you say in your book that um, there were literally hundreds of different gospels, all kinds of different source documents, and that under the Emperor Constantine, it was winnowed down to the, the four gospels that are widely recognized today. And then, yes. obviously, obviously, there have been some other finds in recent decades, yep. uh, you know, the Gospel of Thomas and the Dead Sea Scrolls and all that stuff. Sure. Gospel of Mary Magdalene, Gospel of Judas, all these good things. But right. they all had to be hidden. They had to be hidden, otherwise they would have been destroyed at that mm -hmm. time. Now, the Emperor Constantine is left with a quandary, a conundrum, which is still the, that of modern politicians. How do you simplify things for a bureaucracy? If, if the Roman Empire is going to become Christian, what does Christian mean? So we have to boil all this down. And up until that time, as one scholar describes it, uh, what you had was all these little individual these individual groups all over the Middle East who were Jesus people in some ways, they start out with, let's say, in the Egyptian desert, you know, a mystic who goes into the desert, he has experiences, he has visions, or she can be she too, because there were desert mothers and desert fathers. And, you know, they, they gather people around them, these, these ascetics or these, these mystics, if you want to call them that. And so the community that gathers around them, they're not really up for going into the desert and starving themselves and seeing visions. They just want a community. So then the question is, how do, who, how do we determine what holds this community together? So the community begins to write like little mission statements, as we would call them today in a corporation. And the mission statements would be like, okay, we're going to gather and say a prayer, and then here's the statement of who we are. And these early mission statements become the early creeds of Christianity. And then Constantine boils them all down 
simplifies it all. Okay, four gospels, you know, one creed, this is it. Everything else <laughs> out. Gate, gate, that's it. So it's it's a little absurd the way mo- some modern fundamentalist Christians say, well, the, the Bible is the unerrant, is that the right word? The, you know, the yeah. literal word of God and not not a word can be modified or mis- reinterpreted or anything. It's just like set in stone. This is what God said or wants to have yeah, said. I know. It just seems kind of rigid. Well, it, it is rigid. And again, people... You know, we see it, you know, look and look around. I mean, you've got your midterms coming up in a few days, and this religious right is this very powerful force. It has been for a long time in the U.S., even when I lived there. Uh, it was very powerful. So, you know, people are afraid. People are, want to maintain control over life. They want yeah. it to be the way it used to be. But, you know, it ain't going to happen. Life has changed. Face it, friends. You know, you know, get out of the outer selfie, you know, grasping bit and you know find where it's really coming from find where yourself really comes from that's what yeshua is pointing his his people to we do it this in this country with the u.s constitution i mean you know yeah we're fussing over what these guys thought in 1781 or whatever it was and uh who had no idea what we were going to be dealing with today and in fact i read the other day that jefferson figured that the constitution might last about 19 years and then would have to be completely <laughs> revamped <laughs> anyway would have been a nice idea maybe I... yeah. <laughs> yeah okay well that's a little off track but yeah well you know that's us <laughs> yeah um so as i let me try to define what i understand your book to be um yep. it's it's an attempt to find fresh interpretations of the words that jesus may have spoken um by looking at the original aramaic that he probably used or the words he probably used in aramaic and then considering what the different meanings of those words would have been in the context of his society and um how did you do this did you find enough original Aramaic um, text to work from? Or did you like have to take the English Bible and like figure, all right, what would this have been in Aramaic before it went through whatever it went through to become English? And then, you know, going back to the Aramaic, this is what this verse might mean, as opposed to what it's usually thought to mean. No, it's it's the first rather than the second. It, it's, it makes no sense to go back from English. Okay, so you there are there are then original Aramaic renditions yes. of the gospels yes i use the the bible called peshitta which is what the assyrian christian church uses or actually all aramaic speaking christians today use this peshitta text of the gospels and although that particular aramaic if you will is a little bit newer that is not quite as old as the one jesus spoke all the major words are the same all the words he must have used if he said anything remain the same. And this is my main point with scholars, because I often have to lean on them about this. Uh, If or when he said anything, he said it in Aramaic. And basically the language, the major, major words, like the word about spirit or breath or blessing and good and bad and all this stuff, all these words are the same. And they remain the same uh, from ancient Hebrew even into classical Arabic. A lot of it is it remains the same, really. It's a shared cosmology. It's a shared worldview. So anyway, this this book, <laughs> yeah, thanks. So we're backing into the book. Uh, and you before know, you say that, how did we end up with the King James Bible or whatever the various modern versions of the Bible are? Did did somebody go back to the original Aramaic and go s- from there jump to English, or did it go through Greek and Latin before it got to English? And- it, it went through Greek in most cases, in some cases through Latin, mm-hmm. but it went through Greek. It has to do with, you know, the Reformation, the re- re- arising of the printing press. You know, again, the Aramaic Christians, they point out that, you know, we always had these scriptures, these scrolls, if you will, in our homes for th- for, you know, maybe 1500 years. Whereas you Europeans, it was illegal and punishable by death, even to own a Bible if you were not a priest. Uh This is pre reformation, right? So you could be executed for having a Bible in your home. Most people don't realize this. So they think, well, fundamental. Well, you know, so the, the King James Version was a translation of the King James scholars at the time of 
of King James. Uh, it's actually, in many cases, very poetic, although very wrong in, in most cases. Uh, but in other cases, it's just theology that has interpreted the heck out of it and twisted the meaning incredibly. So, yeah. And I just want to point out one thing, which I think you'll agree with, which is that this is not just a matter of translating things accurately from one language to the other. No. But, um, I mean, you hear people say, um, what would Jesus do? And when I hear them say that, I always think, well, you kind of have to be Jesus in order to, uh -huh. to do that. You have to be in Jesus's state of consciousness to act as Jesus would act. And if you're in some low level of consciousness, you, you simply cannot do what Jesus would do. No. Um, and the same would be true. Uh, same point applies to um, translating uh, scriptures from one language to another. If you are incapable of grasping the profundity of some statement, uh, because you're just not at a level of consciousness which could grok the meaning of it, then how how mutilated is the translation going to be? Quite a bit, yeah. Actually, so um, it's and as you say, it's not just a matter of the of the language itself. Okay, words meant something different then. The word for spirit actually means breath. Okay, so cross out spirit wherever you see it in the New Testament. Write in breath and see if that changes. You know the meaning for you it's not just about that although people like that that's a good thing but it's about the consciousness it's about the cosmology it's about the way of looking at life uh that jesus had and again this is as you say you have to get you have to have this sort of spiritual gestalt if you will where you get into the the feeling of of jesus and this is if you read the gospel of john which I have in the new book, this is actually what he's advocating. You know, feel it like I'm feeling it. Look at it through my eyes. Feel it as though you're embedded in me, and then it'll all make sense to you. You've had me here in the flesh for these years, and now I'm, I'm scarpering off, I'm leaving. You know, so you're on your own, but you know, you can feel me. You know, you can, you can feel me if you make a connection from yourself to your soul. And I think that's one of the main you know, points of the book, really. I was trying to bring together 40 years of work in one book, really. I started out with this little book, Prayers of the Cosmos, in 1990, and then I did various things, you know, over the next 30-plus uh, years. And and this book is, is really meant to bring it all together and place it in one, you could say, one view for people, uh, along with, as, as, much, as well as I could do it, some guided meditations, some contemplations, whatever you want to call them, which are, I think are really some of the keys to the book. Uh, because as you say, you have to feel it. You have to, you have to experience it rather than just, you know, hold it up here. Yeah. And I think there's something to be said for trying to imagine the state of the inner state of a great soul like Jesus, um, trying to feel into it. Um, but that still doesn't mean one totally gets it and but jesus assured people that they could totally get it and you know as evidenced by works that they could potentially perform as he did and even greater works as he said yeah. um but we don't see too much evidence well we see some evidence of that kind some, of thing you know people like not, various yeah. saints levitating and and things like that um but anyway i i think one should always approach this stuff with humility and and realize and not make snap uh in, interpretations of things but realize that one's interpretation is probably going to continue to evolve as as one self evolves it certainly has for me yeah yeah there's there's no that's there's no question of that any anything that's wise you know wisdom words if you want to call them that they will continue to deepen like seeds they'll continue mm -hmm. to grow new plants in oneself otherwise you know, I don't want to be stuck with what I said 20 years ago or 30 years ago about something. Why, why would you do that? Yeah. I mean, Jesus doesn't actually point people to him. I mean, he says, look through me, you know, go through me is what he's talking about when he talks about, you know, connect your small self to the source of that self, which Jung would call the capital S self, or in Aramaic is really called the, the Ruch or the soul, the Rucha you know, connect, make that, that inner connection, and then you'll know what to do. You don't need me to tell you. You don't need some scripture or some holy person to tell you. You'll know what to do. Yeah. So your book mostly consists of 
taking various verses from the Bible and then looking at the original Aramaic and, uh, you know, reinterpreting the verse based upon what it might have meant if you understand the Aramaic. And yes. since since you just mentioned this thing of Jesus didn't say to people, you know, look to me, um, why don't we start with that verse that is so often quoted of, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man sure. cometh unto the Father but by me, which yeah. fundamentalists use as an exclusionary kind of, you know, thing. Yeah, that one plus John 3.16 are the ones that go on the billboards. Yeah, so, which one um, is that, the John 16? Uh, for God so loved the world, etc. Oh, right. Only begotten the, Son, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I've got all that stuff in there. But all these sayings from the Gospel of John that are translated I am do not actually say I am. Because, and this, I'll have to take a pause before I say it for all of you <laughs> listening, um, the ancient Hebrew languages do not have a verb that is translated as am or are or is, a being verb. They do not have this. Why? Because, as you recall, I said they're nomadic. They come out of a nomadic experience. So you can't say, here I am, and this I'm never going to change. Everything is changing. So what he's saying in the Gospels, in the Gospel of John, is literally in Aramaic, ina, I, ina, 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 two inas together. That means I and I. Like the Rastafarians, they talk about the I and I, you know, the connection of the, of the individual I to the source of my, myself, my I, my, not my I, but my, my individuality. Kind of the small s self to big s self. Small s self to big s, that's what he's talking about. Yeah. So if you connect this way, this is the way, he says. This is really, literally the path, is what he is. Then he says, Inanha urha, urha is a path. Shrada is the sense of right direction, which way to go when you come to a crossroads. Roads. He uses this word very often. Um, for instance, um, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. He says, if you, if you know, if you find the heart's direction, of the right direction, then you're free. You know, that is the truth. So he says here in John, Inana Urha Shrada, I am the way. The truth is the sense of right direction or the heart's GPS. And Chai, which is universal in the ancient Semitic languages, means life energy. He doesn't mean life somewhere else or life on a cloud somewhere. This is life energy that is throughout the universes, seen and unseen. So he says, if you make this connection, You'll have your path, you'll know which way to go, and you'll have plenty of energy to travel the path. Now, on the other bit, the exclusive bit, he says, well, this is, as he understands it, and I'll give you a gloss on this, it's more exact in the book. Yeshua says, I understand it. This is the way everyone has gone. This is the way everyone gets to where I've gone, is they follow this inner connection of small self to big self of, you could say, soul, of self to soul. So, and this, as he, his experience is, this is the way it goes. You know, you can go directly, or you can have somebody help you, I'm helping you, but, you know, you, you, you have to start with dealing with your individual self. Right. So in other words, you have to, if you want to get water, you have to hook the pipe up to the reservoir. Um, well, basically. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and some people go, as they say, we, you can use other people to help you, to go through them. Middle Eastern traditions are strong on this. Or you can go direct. You don't have to have, you could say, help. Some people just, and you have, you've had many of the men on your program. They just wake up one morning and, and boom, you know, life has changed. And, and that happens too. So, yeah. So then to summarize that verse, you're basically, it basically says, you know, if you want to be free or, you know, you could even say to reach your full potential, you have to connect Jiva with, with Atman. You have to connect yeah. indiv individual consciousness with universal consciousness, and then you'll be good to go. <laughs> then, you're, then you're good to go. And the rest of it is all him giving you different stories, metaphors, you know, to help, how would we say, corral his, his students into that experience. If you excuse the sheep metaphor, he does use at some point. So 
it's, you know, he uses story language, he uses metaphor, th parables, things like this. It's remarkable. I mean, you know, if we, if we believe that Jesus did all the things he was reputed to do, all the miracles, it's remarkable how abundant they were. I mean, he must have been making such a stir, uh, healing all these people and multiplying loaves and fishes and walking on the water. And I mean, if there were anybody like doing, carrying on like that in today's world, they'd, they'd be like all over YouTube and <laughs> on the evening <laughs> news and stuff like that. It's, um, I mean, it must have been quite um, a shock to, well, yeah, you know, I, I, again, you know, remember that we're 2000 years earlier or so in human consciousness. So the understanding of the, and I'm going to switch psychology language in here, the understanding of a liminal realm, a realm between the realms between this every day, and the unseen is is much more people are open to that. I see. That's why you have people who are able to see demons or devils or things like this. Um, and these can be shared experiences even. So, I mean, one of the things that struck me about his healings is that uh, it says in the usual translation, Jesus shows up in a village, you know, and he, he preaches and everybody flocks to him. Well, the word for preach in Aramaic just means he announced himself. And so he comes to the village, he says, Okay, here I am. Have you heard about me? It's not like he's giving him a Sunday sermon. And because they people were living under this traumatic reality, and, and they were living in these dissociated states, all these people pour out to be healed. I mean, and, and some of these dissociated states would lead to, as we would now call it physical ailments. And so because he can make this connection a healthy connection to the unseen, you know, he's able to, he's able to heal them. Um, it's, it's as simple as that, because how is it that were all these, these unwhole, these ailing people running around in Palestine at the time? I mean, you know, was every other person sick? Well, it's because again, because they were all living under a traumatic reality and had been for generations. Yeah, I mean, we see that today. And we do Afghanistan and places where the people of Somalia people have been so traumatized by yeah. de decades of brutality. Yeah. Um, well, that's an interesting point you made about um, how that the the consciousness of the people was much uh, less well we were talking earlier about the, the materialist paradigm that dominates today it was it was much um more uh subtle than that in a way or or you know in tune with the you know deeper levels at which you know things like angels or you know all that all that were considered normal you know we just part yeah. of the people's understanding sure i mean it, it was I would call it, it's, it was much more embedded, Rick. Yeah. It, everything was more embedded in, in, each, in each other, in nature, in all of this. Now, that has, that has a downside if you're in a so-called dysfunctional family, uh, as we would use in today's terms, or if you're living in a terrible reality. But, but this is why people were, you know, having these, yeah. these unhealthy states, if you will. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, so let's take some other verses. So you've you've you know interpreted the Lord's Prayer, the Beatitudes, and all kinds of verses that are. I've always uh, you hit some you know a lot of the greatest hits like if a house divided <laughs> itself against itself cannot stand and 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 all that. So let's I, we couldn't possibly cover them all, but um, and when those of you who are listening live, if there are particular verses you'd like um, Douglas to comment on, Neil to comment on, um, send them in to a question and, and maybe he, he can comment on that one. But what one would you like to do next? Um, I think the one I want to do is, um, is about the words for uh, good and evil which are very key uh, in, in the Gospels, because 
Uh, for instance, Jesus is quoted as saying, a good tree bears good fruit and an evil tree bears evil fruit. So how does this tree become morally evil? Was he speaking uh, metaphorically? The, He's not talking about well, no, this is, literal this is trees. The, this is the King James Version translation. Uh, good tree bears good fruit, or evil tree bears evil fruit. Well, what he's saying, actually, is the word for good in Aramaic, the word that's usually translated as good from the Greek, actually means ripe, R-I-P-E. That is, is at its right time, at its right place. Again, think nomadic reality. You know, think timing, you know, being in the moment, all of this. So a ripe tree bears ripe fruit, and an unripe tree bears unripe fruit. And, and you might say, well, Jesus, that's a no-brainer. Well, he says, but he's, say, he's saying to his students, look around you, look at nature, live the way, live the way nature is, live as a ripe tree. Don't live as, a, as an unripe tree, not in the moment. Be in the moment, um, in the right time, at the right place, with the right action. And then this then becomes the word, the, for, the form of the word takes the main word for blessing, in the New Testament. So for instance, all of these so-called Beatitudes, blessed are the dot dot dot. The word for blessed are, really there's no are because you heard me say that before, but the word for blessing means ripe, ripeness. For instance, in the first Beatitude, usually translated blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, he says uh, ripe are those, ripening are those who find their home in the breath. Poor in spirit is the tr King James translation, but means that the person is holding on to the breath, to their breathing, as though it were their first and last possession, which actually it is. I mean, it's the first thing that comes into our bodies when we come into life, it's the last thing that leaves. He says, when you, when you hit rock bottom, in this way, then things begin to open up for you. Then you have, then comes to you, Dilhone is coming to you, Dilhone Malkuta, not kingdom, actually queendom in Aramaic because it's feminine gendered. Then comes to you the sense of empowerment, of vision, vision with empowerment that is throughout the whole cosmos. You have a much bigger home then. You have a sense of vision with the energy to accomplish a vision in life. So, but you have to sort of go to the what you know the twelve steppers call you know rock bottom, and start from there really. So, do you mean rock bottom the way a twelve stepper would, where you've just you know really bottomed out and you're you're desperate, or do you mean rock bottom in terms of some uh, you know deeper fundamental level of reality that you that you connect with? Well, for the that can be that... thought of as a foundation or a rock bottom too. Yeah, it can. E either one. I mean, the people to whom Jesus spoke the Beatitudes in Matthew seem to have been really at rock bottom. They were homeless. They had nowhere to go. Uh, they had been driven off their land. Uh, they, you know, maybe driven out of their family. And so, literally, they didn't know where to go or what to do. And so he begins to give this, you could say... He's encouraging them, to say. He, he's, he's starting a process with them, which yeah. proceeds through the Beatitudes, from starting with finding your home in the breath, to acknowledging the places that are mourning or grieving or confused in you, and then it goes on and on through the different, different Beatitudes, the so-called Beatitudes, yeah. Maybe what he's saying there is, yeah, I know things are really rough for you people, but I have something to teach you here which will actually bring you fulfillment and inner happiness regardless of your outer circumstances and might in fact improve your outer circumstances yeah and and you know it's not just the words again imagine that there is an atmosphere of this right. person um, as one has in authentic spiritual teachers today where one sort of can feel that yeah you know you can f feel their way of of being with of being and perceiving and living with that what what, what one would you like to do next Let's see, where shall we go? I can throw a few um, at you, but I want you to choose if possible. Well, you know, gosh. <laughs> I started with the uh, prayer of Jesus, the so-called Lord's Prayer, although I argue that there's no word in, the, uh, in Aramaic that is actually well translated as Lord. 
that's a medieval feudalistic concept that gets layered over onto the Gospels. So I just call it the prayer of Jesus, the one that he gives in words. So we can look a little bit at that. I'll, I'll dip into a bit of that, but I'd like to remind people that Jesus didn't always pray in words. When it says he went into the hills and stayed overnight praying, it doesn't mean he's mumbling words to himself all night. You know, he's talking about in another place in the Gospels, pray just with my atmosphere. That means in silence, you know, pray with my Shem, which is the word for atmosphere or light, or, you know, the light that you feel through my atmosphere. Pray, just pray that way. Pray in the silence. Pray with that feeling. Well, you, you gives, mentioned the atmosphere around a spiritual teacher like that. Yeah. Um, you've probably experienced it, and I know I have. Yeah. You can entrain with the teacher's consciousness exactly. by sitting in that atmosphere and, you know, shift into something very profound just by mere proximity. Absolutely. It's a human thing. You don't need any special apparatus. You can, you know, if you feel your breath and feel your heart, you're there. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need anything special, actually. I mean, the only reason I'm doing all this with Jesus is because many people were, have been burdened with Jesus in their childhood, as I was to some degree, although not as bad as some people. And so when they go into other traditions, Vipassana or anything, Advaita, this or that, they may reach a certain point where, they, where their childhood comes up to them. And part of that childhood is uh, sort of uh, fear and loathing around Jesus, basically. Jesus phobia, I call it. And that prevents them from actually, you know, going a little further. So for a lot of people that have come to my work, you know, that's how they they found their way to it. They they went elsewhere and then they figured, well, I guess I better heal this too. So, yeah, I was just watching a series on television called Anne with an E, which is based on Anne with Green, Anne of Green Gables. Oh. And uh, there was a there's a part of the story where the missionaries or these Christian people are taking young Indian kids away from their parents and locking yeah. them in these residential schools, which we've heard a lot about recently because the Pope yeah. went and apologized for that. But um, and one of their phrases was "kill the Indian to save the child," and yeah. they were they were yeah. literally killing many of them. But they were also yeah. just you know brutalizing their their whole traditional understanding in order to supposedly save them. I mean, it, yeah. you know, it makes my blood boil sometimes when I think of the the number of people who have been the, the genocides that have been committed in Absolutely. the name of religion. And I'm afraid that Christianity might, if you look at the whole history of all religions, it might be in the lead in that, you know, unfortunate regard. It, it is. I mean, if I could, we can segue into that briefly. I mean, I, I would agree in that um, a misinterpretation, not only of the Gospels, but also of the whole Bible, uh, empowers colonialism, racism, and ecocide. And one of the key verses I point to, which when I did my book on Genesis, I retranslated, was one of the most egregious um, mistranslations, deliberate mistranslations in the history of translation, which is the verse in Genesis that's usually translated, be fruitful, multiply, dominate and subdue the earth and rule over and then dot 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 it's all the other ones that were created in genesis before the human well the hebrew doesn't say that the hebrew says yes you will be fruitful and you will multiply learn how to manage not dot, learn how to manage your own earth your own earthiness your own material existence learn how to manage that and then it doesn't say rule over, you know, the, the fish and the animals and the trees. It says rule together with, rule along with, rule from within. This is a total mistranslation of a Hebrew preposition. Um, this pre preposition is never meant over, as in rule over, in its whole history, either ancient Hebrew or modern history. So th this just gets read right into it because, well, it has to say that because we have to dominate, you know, we, we're, we're now in charge right. and we're going to yeah. go. We heard there's whoever. gold in, uh, in, you know, among the Incas and we want to, we want it. So let's go there. And, and you know, you native peoples are not using this land, you know, so you're not there. You don't exist. Yeah. It's like that. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> we're, we're getting back into rant mode. 
Um, I know. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I do it too. I, I tend just... to get into that quite a bit. But uh... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just uh, there's so many injustices. You know, it's, it's so ironic, tragically ironic, that so many injustices have been perpetrated in the name of what should be the greatest blessing. Uh, you know that a person could possibly have in life yeah. you know the 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 blessing of knowing god and experiencing god it's it's just so yeah. so twisted yeah it's it's difficult it's you know it's um as i say the human consciousness is, is developed in such a way that now we're stuck with everything that this has resulted in is in front of us i mean it's all in front of us now. Yeah. So how are in, we going to use In other words, the, like the condition of the world, the condition of the environment, all that everything, stuff. Everything, everything. Yeah. How are we going to use this human self, which is now separated? How can we turn? How can we return, as the Hebrew mystics talk about? And again, this is where Jesus is constantly giving this, you could say, his, his mode, his map, although the map is not the traveling, to turn from your small self to the big self, yourself to your soul, from the breath which is only living in this body, this material form for X number of years, and the breath which is everywhere and all the time, and before my birth and after my death, bef you know, before my, you know, my original face and after my last face, if I can paraphrase the Buddhists on that one. So, you know, we have to, we're either going to make the shift or we're not. Right. Uh, okay, well, that reminds me of, of, of a verse, because um, uh, I think of, you know, s deep spirituality as being the ultimate solution to the world's problems. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the verse, um, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all else should be added unto thee. Yeah, yeah. Let's work on that one. Well, uh, my translation, although it's not in this new book, it says if you're going to, if you're going to aggravate yourself and run around and pursue anything, do that first about finding, and again, these words, kingdom, again, it's malkuta in Aramaic, it's actually queendom, feminine gendered, and it means this combination of a vision with an empowerment. And you know, a lot of your, your interviewees have had this in these awakening moments. They've had because sort of a, okay, it's not just that they had a vision of something somewhere else, but they had, a, this was downloaded into them, in the sense that was empowering to them, whether they're a psychic or, you know, a non-aligned mystic or whoever they are. So they have this sense of the Malkuta. And this Malkuta is throughout Shemaya, he says, the kingdom of heaven. Heaven not up there, but heaven being the realm of light and vibration that is everywhere around us, underneath us, above us, and within us. It's the, so as I called it in another book, sort of the wave reality that the new physics people talk about rather than the particle reality. So he says, you know, don't fuss yourself too much about all the particle reality. You know, find first this connection, this connection to that which is always on uh, and which you can always rely upon. And then you will have a, a real, if I can make the point of this, you know, then you'll have a real non-duality because everything will be included. You know, you'll have the individual self included but it will be included in that which is empowering it every breath. Yeah, empowering is a good word. And I, I mean, I see that inner world as being a, the, the potentiality from which the whole universe arises. And if a person is cut off from it, and I bet you there's some Bible verse about this, then they are like a, a plant that is cut off from you know, contact with the ground or the nourishment from the earth. Whereas if they're deeply connected to it, then it just pours into their individual life and through their individual life um, to all whom they contact. Yeah, that's that's exactly right, Rick. Um, the, the verse I think you're alluding to is the one where uh, he says, uh, this is the, another one of the ones that people make a lot out of in Christian fundamentalism, the so-called sin against the Holy Ghost. Well, he... Jesus talks about, well, sin in Aramaic means to cut yourself off from something. That's Does it also mean to miss the mark? I've, also, I've heard it translated. Uh, it can, it can yeah. mean that. It's, um, it depends on which word for sin. Okay. Uh, the Greek is actually the same, but the Aramaic is more sort of like cutting yourself off. I know I've heard this thing about missing the mark. With the like I said with the plant, uh, cutting yourself off from the source of your nourishment. You're cutting yourself off yeah. from, the, from what's called rucha de kutsha, he calls it. That is the breath. Rucha is breath. Dukutcha, that breath which is throughout 
everything, that breath which em empowers our breathing every moment. It's, it's the atmosphere of the earth, it's the climate, it's the atmosphere of the universe, non-physical, physical, it's all of that. So he says, don't cut yourself off from that. You know, you won't, you, this, this separation, this cannot be healed, this sin, so to speak, cannot be healed because you've, you're no longer breathing in, you know, in a unified way, in a unified way with cosmos, uh, with everything that empowers the cosmos. Yeah. <clears throat> Good. Um, and what about the, I've also heard the one, the kingdom of heaven is within you. And then some people say within means the same as among. Because a lot of a lot of you know modern spiritual people use that verse to defend to to you know explain meditation, for instance, where you take sure. your attention deep within and you arrive at the kingdom of heaven. They're absolutely right. It's the same word in Aramaic. Within and among are the same word, and this again points to what I was mentioning earlier on in our talk. That okay, my withinness. What I now call my subconscious, my psychology, you know, this is also connected to what is around me. It's not like, okay, my inner life is just my inner life and it doesn't affect anything. No, my community life affects my inner life, my inner life affects my community life. So this within and among, they had this all sort of intertwined in, in the ancient times. I mean, the Gospel of Thomas, he talks about a uh, similar verse, he talks about uh, the so-called Malkuta da Allah, the kingdom, queendom, well, I was called the I can of the cosmos, is as though it's arising within you and then spreading around you. So that includes both of them, the meanings. Now, I think about 15 minutes ago, you were about to start talking about the Lord's Prayer, and then I, I, side, I sidetracked you onto something. So if you want well, to come back I, to I sidetracked myself, so <laughs> no mea culpa is necessary. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, the, the prayer, again, you know, the, the place of prayer for many people is fraught, that it is difficult, because, you know, devotional practice, we while it can be heart opening, it can also lead to its abuses. And one sees that in many aspects of fundamentalist religion, not only Christianity, but other types of religion, because you're placing God out there somewhere, you know, it's like, you know, up on some throne or this or that or the other thing. And again, I hope I've said enough in the time we've talked together to indicate that Jesus was not coming from this sort of place. He's coming from a place where a prayer is like like a chant, if, if you will, that help attune you to different realities within your soul, so that you can make that connection that we've been talking about between self and soul. And so he begins with this beautiful word in the so-called Lord's Prayer, Avun, Avun Debashimaya, O Thou, O, o Breathing, O breathing, O creating source, O parenting source throughout the cosmos. And again, why, why idealize it all? Well, because to idealize, I have to in, invoke, you could say, my imaginal sense, as Henry Corbin calls it. I have to, I have to envision the best, of, the, the, the best of what I can imagine and place that as something for me to grow into. So this is the, the function of it's of, of prayers in general that, you know, okay, you're going to pray to Krishna, that's fine, but be Krishna. You don't want to be a Buddhist, be a Buddha, you know. Uh, so praising is, is about finding a doorway, opening a doorway in, in one's heart so that the heart can turn easily between self and soul. This is the key place of the heart in ancient Semitic prayers or in ancient Semitic culture in general. Again, ancient Semitic languages, they don't have words for mind, really, or brain, or, you know, any of this other stuff. They only have a word for heart. So, he says, O thou breathing, life of all, creating one throughout the whole cosmos, uh, create a space, empty me a bit, to create that presence here. You know, what they usually translate as, hallowed be thy name. Well, hollow, hollow oneself, 
so that that sound, that vibration of the cosmos can resonate within you, of reality. And then it goes on from there, basically. And again, he talks about Malkuta, you know, then this leads you to this I can, this vision with the empowerment. And then you're ready, and this is the payoff, then you're ready to bring heaven and earth together. Then you're ready to, with your own heart's desire, heart's will, let your heart's desire come through me. This is the one translated as, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, it's not willpower, and it's not someone else's will. It says, let your heart's desire, nechwe sibiyanach, nechwe sibiyanach, let your heart's desire be done through me, and so that will bring heaven and earth together in my life. In other earth words, God's God. heart's desire, you're saying? Yeah, let, yeah, well, yeah, let the yeah. heart of reality, right. well, you have to use the G word, let the heart of whatever, the great mystery, come through my heart and then bring my life together so that I connect, connect my individual experience in life with my communal experience, my communal experience in life, in my world. In other words, you know, how, what am I going to do now? You know, that's wonderful that I have this moment of illumination, but what now? And do I have to go out and convert everybody else to my moment of illumination? Well, no. I mean, you, but you have to find out what is yours to do and then do that very well. And, and this is what Jesus points to. The rest of it is all about, okay, now what do we do in our communal life? Well, we can share bread and not hoard more bread than we need to hoard. Bread meaning not wheat or even gluten-free bread, but any food. So the bread, word for bread, lachma, can just mean any food. Could be emotional food, mental food, like that. Sometimes I fear I've hoarded too much uh, Aramaic biblical food, but I'm trying to give it away as fast as I can. <laughs> so I'm hoping people spread it. And then it's about releasing, untying, forgiving. And the main thing about the line about forgiveness, uh, which is usually translated... Um, Boeing, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Uh, is it trespassing is going about is about going over somebody's boundaries? Um, the Luke version has again the sense of untangling knots, a slightly different word in in Luke's remembrance of the prayer, or maybe Jesus said it different ways, different times. People do that. Go figure. So untangle these knots. You know, so if you can unstep an overstep boundary, do it, and then everything will be released at the same time. So it's not as though if you do this, then you get the reward later. No, it all happens simultaneously. Uh, it's not like an if-then thing. And then the words that give people a lot of problem, mistranslations here, uh, usually translated, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And why the heck would God lead us into temptation? Well, mistranslation. The Aramaic says clearly, let us not enter. Nisiyuna, which really means forgetfulness. And forgetfulness is a big theme in the Middle Eastern spiritual traditions. This is why the Sufis have a, a practice called dhikr, which is remembrance. So the Nisayuna is the opposite of this. We also find it in Arabic, classical Arabic. And it means forgetfulness of where we've come from, of our original face, of where we're going, you know, of the bigger picture of life. Don't forget, don't forget. But then he says also, Ela patsan min bisha, set us free from bisha, unripeness. Again, back to that word I mentioned half hour ago. Set us free from not acting at the right time, at the right place, in the right moment with what is mine to do. And then, the, you know, it ends with a beautiful sort of praise statement or a dedication. And Semitic languages also have this sort of dedication that one has in Buddhism, too, where you would say, I dedicate this now for the benefit of all beings. Well, in Aramaic, you offer it up in different ways, and, and then Jesus offers one way at the end of the Aramaic prayer. He says, for, you know, all of this returns to you, the Malkuta, that is the I can and the vision and the energy, and then what is usually translated as glory is really song or music, you could say, and uh, this, this music is of my life is returning to you, uh, and we move on. Hmm. Amen. Nice. 
Speaking of fundamentalists, <laughs> you mentioned them. Speaking of which. <laughs> um, let, you know, what do you make of uh, converting people, speaking in tongues, handling snakes, um, being saved? You know, I guess handling snakes is kind of a rare one. But, you know, some of the um, certainly speaking in tongues is more common than that. And, and you know, converting others to save them because they're all going to hell uh, forever if, if we don't save them. And, uh you know, we're saved because we believe such and such. I mean, they derive these beliefs um, or they use various Bible verses as excuses for these beliefs. How would you reinterpret some of the common verses which are basic to those um, behaviors? Well, if we stay with conversion for a bit, there's a basic misunderstanding of what the soul is for, for Yeshua or the, the, the real self. It's all over the Gospels. It's called Ruha. It's similar and related to the word for breath. It's that always on part of us, if you will. And there are terrible mistranslations or confused mistranslations throughout the King James and other versions of the Gospels, where the word self and soul and, you know, life are mistranslated as one another. This is this confuses things. Because for Yeshua, we don't need to save our soul. No one needs to save our soul. We need to simply let our soul save us. That is, redeem us, show us what to do. We don't need to save our soul. Let your soul save you. That's that's his basic message. So what does that do to conversion? Well, I mean, if you look actually in the gospel in the book of Acts, and I ventured a little bit into Acts in the new book, just not too far, but um, all of the early people who come to the Jesus movement, we could call it that, or one of the Jesus movements, they don't have theology. There's no theology being preached to them. The people like Peter, they're just saying, receive the, receive Rucha de Kutcha, receive the breath, receive the, the, the sacred breath. We received it from Yeshua, this transmission, if you will, this atmosphere here, We'll give it to you if you want it. And, so, you know, end of story, you know, and communities form around this only later, as I mentioned, do you have theology, mission statements, on and on and on like this. So it's all about transmission and people being attracted naturally. It's not about going out and converting the poor heathen. So in other words, the apostles weren't pushy. They were sort of like, you know, Come if you want. Here I am, and uh, you know if you don't want, then fine. There's that kind of attitude, apparently. Well, I mean, you could say Jesus was not spectacularly successful, uh, looking at the long history of things. But on the other hand, his immediate disciples uh, seem to have had something. They seem to have had whatever you want to call it, some real, for want of a better word, spiritual magnetism. Um, no doubt, some went off the rails, but. They had something that people would would be attracted to them, basically, and they didn't. Why do you say lot. Jesus wasn't spectacularly successful? I mean, well, just looking at the long history of Christianity. Oh actually. well, yeah, I wouldn't Although blame him for that. Although we can look at that though. in any religion, it's true. So yeah, um, but you know, we don't know. It, the The story the story is not completely written, so we won't. I won't prejudge anything on yeah. that regard. But, also, I wouldn't blame these, Jesus for you know what has been no, done in his no, name. No, that's and, you know, I run into that quite a bit. So. <laughs> Uh, this thing about snake handling and all of that, well, people like to prove their faith. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, there are, although mostly unknown to Westerners, there are some Sufi groups who do things similar in terms of piercing themselves with skewers in the same sort of fashion to prove their faith in the unseen uh, sheikh, basically. So uh, I'm not a member of one of those groups. I'm still, you know, Unpierced, but uh, <laughs> I'm not a member of any. But you know, th this is this has been known throughout history. This sort of ascetic practice to show, you know, that you okay, okay, um, I'm going to rely only on on that, whatever that is, and I'm going to trust that and and go for that. So I'm I'm not so down on down on all that. I mean, no one's going to force you to go into snake handling, are they? So. Uh, not likely. I mean, the other thing, yeah. 
I think that's in Peter somewhere or something like that. And, you know, I think Peter, if I'm, if I'm mis, excuse me, if I'm misremembering to those who are better on their Bible than I am, I think it's Peter who is bitten by a snake and yeah, he's fine. He's no, no problem. A poisonous snake, by the way. So, you know, this all gets extrapolated from little bits in the epistles. That is the letters that come later from Paul and Okay, let's get off of snakes. So um, we'll get off of snakes. <laughs> so here's snakes a, are good, and I won't go into snakes. Okay, never uh, mind. I see snakes them on are, my walks in the woods. They're really cute. They lie in the sun on the trail, and I'm careful uh, to you know, step over snakes them. Snakes are are sacred in a lot of Middle Eastern cultures. So. Yeah, some 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 relationship to Kundalini there, maybe. Uh -huh. um, so um, how, this is a, a popular one. I and my father are one. Yes. Well. What he says here, this is again, Gospel of John, chapter 10, I believe. He says, um, it, it happens in a sort of a, a punctuation mark at a particular story, but I'll tell only the short version. He's called for, in front of the scribes, that is the temple officials, several times, particularly in the Gospel of John. And... Um, and they ask him, by what right are you doing these things? And he says at one point, um, before Abraham was, I am. Again, remember, there's no am. So he's pointing to, I'll get to your past. And Abraham moment. preceded Jesus by a thousand years or two or whatever. Co correctly. Right? Yeah. And because the Middle Eastern way of looking at time is different than the Western way of looking, it's as though the past is in front of us. It's the ancient Middle Eastern way of looking at time. And the future is behind us, and we're all traveling. Again, remember nomadism. So we're following our ancestors. We're following the best of our ancestors. And we want to make sure that we leave something for our children who are coming along behind us and our children's children. So there was this sense of continuity and constant travel. So when Jesus says before Abraham, he means that you could say the idea, or you could say the archetype, I use a Jungian term, the archetype of the human, of the complete human being, the completing human being was there before Abraham. It was there in the heart of the great mystery when all this happened and when self separated from soul to some degree and Adam and Eve and all that great stuff. And, you know, then we get challenged. And so the idea of a person that could turn easily, turn his or her heart easily from self to soul and back again, this was already seated in the cosmos before Abraham. And then they say, and then the scribes say to him, you know, you're hardly 30 years old. How are you saying you're before Abraham? What? <laughs> what? You know, what's that about? So he's, and he says, well, you know, then he says, well, I, you know, I, ina, um, inana, he says, uh, not I and the Father are one, but he says, uh, I, ina wa abi had hanan. I to pull it out of the memory banks. I and that breathing life of all, the creating source of the cosmos, live together. We are one living together. Now that is a paradox in the sense that how can you have one and be together? This is about non-duality, actually. So you have a, a oneness, a unity, that is also a togetherness. Possible? Well, for Yeshua, it was possible. So he's not saying he is God, but he's saying as though or he's not saying he is the great mystery. Well, how could that be? Because he's in a body and, you know, his soul is part of that great mystery. It's living within that great mystery, within Allah, which is his word he uses for reality or, so to speak, God. He's embedded within that reality. It's living together. And the word Hanan in Aramaic uh, comes later into Arabic, actually, as a word for love. So there is a love relationship in this living togetherness with the creating source with the cosmos, you know, with with this birthing, fathering, mothering of the cosmos. Yeah. And that doesn't get him in, you know, that doesn't cut any dice with him either. So he gets out of Dodge and leaves Jerusalem again. It seems to me, I mean, aren't there verses in are there verses in the Bible which describe God as omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, those words? 
All of that is Greek construct from the creeds, Rick. Uh-huh. Um, and we have it in other religions too. I mean, yeah, you know, be, but I mean, is that all, something that your basic Christian would agree with that God is omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent and all that? Yeah, but that that begs the question. Um, then, then what is this? <laughs> this is God. <laughs> Ta-da. Exactly. So, <laughs> you know, that, that should beg that question, but usually it's construed in such a way that this omnipresent omniscient, it's up in a cloud somewhere and it's in some transcendental reality that is in what I would call a platonic heaven. Yeah, but then it's not the, omnipresent if it's up there and we're down here and, there, and exactly. you know, separate. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, there's some, know. God is off in some corner someplace. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, anyway, so let's see. What shall we do here? I've got all these. I got six pages worth of. I took all the. <laughs> I got. I took all the verses, the actual verses from your book, because I and put them on six pages in thirteen sure. point type, and I'm just sort of whatever would um, catch my eye. Um, well, there's the only begotten Son thing. So, so God yeah. for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Uh, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Um, I, actually, I've had instances where Christian uh, evangelists or something have called me on the phone out of the blue, and I start talking astronomy with them in terms of how many planets there must be in, in the universe, and and by by odds, how many of those must be inhabited. And then I say, well, is Jesus on tour? And does he spend 33 <laughs> years on each of them? And and if the if the universe is only 6,000 years old, then how does he get around that? Is it like Santa Claus somehow does all the households in the world on Christmas Eve? <laughs> you know, then they, ha- they hang up. Yeah, I, I have that with uh, sometimes Jehovah's Witnesses come around here. Yeah, and, yeah. And uh, I used to say, well, do you oh, really man. want to know I, like how the, the word is actually pronounced? And they run the other way. <laughs> I'd love to see you in a conversation with the Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, I, they try to give me literature and I give them literature back. Little do they know whose door they knocked on. No, they don't know. But anyway, um, where were you we with God that? God is uh, only begotten son. Oh, the only begotten son, yeah. Well, ask them next time what only begotten actually means. Yeah. What it, what, it says the only born, be, to beget, to begot. Anyway, the Aramaic has nothing. The Aramaic says fully integrated. Allah loved the worlds of diversity, that is, so-called material reality, so much that, he's, that Allah, and again, sends a fully integrated human being. So that whoever has not believes in him, but whoever believes and has trust like he does. This is again another preposition thing. So Jesus never says to people, believe in him. He says, have the same trust, trust with me, trust within me, or believe with me. Uh, it's really not about beliefs or concepts. It's about having trust that there is this only reality, Allah, he calls it, and that this is. This is the ground of being. Again, to use another Buddhist term, this is the ground. This this is where we come from and where we're going. So, whoever has the same trust I do will not. You could say. Will not disappear, with their individual form. But they will continue. Like the breath will continue. Like your breath will continue from world to world. And whether that implies reincarnation or not, I don't know if we want to go there or not, but, you know, you can read it whatever way you want. And I would say, depending on how we define the word trust, that maybe trust is the first step. Um, You know, like if you have as much faith as a grain of mustard seed, that that whole idea, um, then you can move mountains. And it's it's more like you get your foot in the door with a certain amount of trust, but then there's... uh, a lot more than just trusting or believing there there's actually undergoing the transformation necessary to be able to function or or experience as Jesus did. Yes, absolutely. And you know, that's what he keeps pointing people to, you know. While he's there, they they trust him, they trust his atmosphere, they trust his being, and then towards the end of the gospel of John he's trying to tell them, okay, how are you going to do this after I'm gone? How, you know, what what's 
what's going to be there for you. So develop mm -hmm. that. Yeah, right. Good point. Um, all right, I'm going to fire some questions at you, which means we're going to jump around a bit from one okay. topic to the next. But a lot of people <laughs> send in questions, and I want to you know ask them oh, okay uh, um and so i i think irene's saying there are a lot of them so let's not go too long on everyone but just say okay. what, whatever you feel needs to be said so this this one was sent in the other day sarah page from ascot england did did yeshua die on the cross mm -hmm. i have had what sounds like a shea come to me in meditations but i'm still unsure of its true meaning so can you shed light on this so there's two questions basically there Again, as I was just mentioning, um, you know, and, and again, I've, I've read a lot of books about this too, um, that he didn't die on the cross. Um, he's, he, was, he was revived with aloe and went to India and all of this is possible. I'm not saying it's not possible. It is possible. On the other hand, or at the same time, the different Gospels report that after his so-called crucifixion, different people had experiences of him, partially in the body or not in the body or in what we would take call spirit body or all of this, all of this was there for them. And that should, should not be a surprise because he actually promises this again at the end of the Gospel of John that he says, you know, if you I'm going, and then, but I'm, there will be a place where you can connect with me. This is this so-called my house with many mansions. You know, I go to prepare a place for you. I go, and the place is not a physical condominium somewhere in heaven. It's a state of consciousness is the word that's used there. In Hebrew, it's called a makom. In Aramaic, it's called an atra. That is, is a state of consciousness, like the prophets go into in the Hebrew Bible, like Ezekiel or Isaiah do, when they have these visions. There will be a place where you can go in there, go and contact me. It's just there. And then he goes on to say how they contact him, you, you know, to what, what methods they're going to use to do that. So that's clear, of course. Uh, did he die on the cross? Some part of him, no doubt, died, um, but not the rest. Not yeah. the real bit. I mean, it, it, <laughs> The fact that um, he supposedly came out of the tomb three days after he was crucified in in reasonably good shape um, makes it <laughs> seem like uh, his physical body must have died. It must be some spiritual body because he wouldn't have been up for come unless he had some miraculous self healing abilities. There are different theories about this. You can read the books, Rick, and you know he yeah. ended up in India. His tomb is in Kashmir and Srinagar right. and yeah, I've heard all, that all sorts stuff. of good stuff. It's possible. I'm not saying it ain't possible. No, it was a good attitude. Who knows? Okay, I'm going to hit you some, some more questions. So, yep. uh, next one from Has Hasim Sadka. Do, do, do people from different faiths see angels or divine beings of other faiths? Hmm. And if you don't know, don't, you can just say, I don't know. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, but certainly it would be possible. Yeah. It depends on if you're tuned to multiple faiths. I guess a similar question is, if, if you're a Christian, you die, do you see Jesus? If you're a Hindu, do you see Krishna? If you're a Buddhist, do you see Buddha, you know, when you go to heaven? Um, do you, in other words, is, is the initial, at least the um, antechamber of heaven, fashioned to make you feel comfortable when you get there? Well, again, back to this passage in John I mentioned, he says, you know, in that place, there are many mansions, many right. places you can go. You know, you could you could go a lot of places, and um, there are. Don't forget about the non-lined people. They're not necessarily Christian, Buddhist, this or that. And so, you know, what about for them? They may, you know, any anything could happen. We it's a, it's a big mystery out there. Yeah. Really. yeah. <clears throat> There's a nice verse in the in the Gita where Krishna says that um, anybody anywhere, if they have any sort of faith or expression of you know religious whatever. Uh, you know, I accept that. I honor that. I appreciate that. It doesn't have yeah. to be in any particular form yeah. or even to him or anything else. Yeah. Um, all right. So a uh, question from Travis Rybarski in Richland, Washington. On your website, there's a quote from Jung, which states that Christians must create their own yoga rather than borrow from China or India. Could you explain why you like this quote? To me, it seems like a very good thing when Christians borrow from their elder sibling traditions. Well, 
I mean, it's in the context of what it is. I mean, Jung says, which I basically agree with, that you ha if you're raised in a particular way, at some point you're going to have to confront that um, and deal with it and heal with it in order to go further. Uh, of course, it's good to borrow. I mean, it's, it's good to learn many things. You have, I mean, certainly. As the Quran says, you know, seek wisdom even unto China. Yeah. So I, I don't see any problem with that. But Jung did feel that, well, Jung actually felt, if you read um, Peter Kingsley's work, that his form of therapy would become this Christian yoga. But then it gets perverted into a, you could say, a more materialistic psychological technique for many people, not all. And the visionary spiritual capacity that he had, that Jung had envisioned for it was sort of Lost. pushed aside. Uh -huh. And that's, that's from Peter Kingsley. And I would encourage people who disagree with me to read his book, Catafalque, which is about Jung and Jung's legacy and all of that. He'd be another good one for your program if you can get him. But I don't uh, we actually can. reached out to him years ago, and he was sort of potentially interested, and we haven't followed up on it. So maybe, yeah. maybe one of these days. Um, this is from Daniel Ramirez from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, several prominent Western spiritual teachers talk about the deep undercurrent of unworthiness that plagues us in the Western world, connecting this to our founding mythology of the Garden of Eden and our supposed core of original sin. Is it possible to be raised in the West and escape that fundamental feeling of unworthiness? Further, is there a path for us to create a new life-affirming mythology? Absolutely. Nice question. It is possible. I can speak from experience. I was raised with all this original thin stuff, at least in, in, in school. In school, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so it was like that. But yeah, I mean, again, this is a misinterpretation of the Adam and Eve and the, and the serpent story. And again, I have that in my book, Original Meditation. Uh, how that should actually, how the one is reading that. But basically, it's about, you know, if you look at that, it's again, like a Sufi story or a Zen story, you know, you've got the original human beings, and they are given a choice. Uh, you know, here, here, you can eat all of this, but don't, don't eat that, you know. And what is this tree that they can't eat? Well, it's the so-called tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is basically about having preference. In other words, I, I like this and I don't like that. So when does that happen in human consciousness? When does the human self become able to, to choose between what it likes and what it, it doesn't like? When does that part of the human self evolve such that we're no longer so embedded in this natural reality that we that I've spoken about earlier, that we've individuated and now I have a choice. And who is it that said, I think it was the Buddha said the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences, something like that. And, and so this is all about the human self evolving. It's not good or bad. It's not original sin. It's just what happened. And it's what happens to children as we grow up. I mean, we grow up and we're sort of embedded in this, this beautiful childhood, or for many of us, it's fairly beautiful. Um, some obviously not so much. But at some point, the, the, the self of the child, of myself as a child, begins to awaken. And I, you know, there you go. So it's the same that humanity goes through. I've been having some conversations with friends recently about judgment versus discernment. Yeah, um, and it kind of relates to the question we we were just discussing. Um, Jesus said, "Judge not, lest you be judged." Right? And maybe yeah. you can give us yeah. the spin on that verse. What do you what do you make of that phrase? Judge not, lest you be judged. And the whole consideration of having preferences, which are healthy in life, if they are not out of proportion. Yeah, it is about having preferences because the word the Aramaic word Jesus uses for judge. Here, I mean, in this passage you mentioned, and also in John, it's really about, <clears throat> it's based on the word um, din, which means to find what is one's, you could say, what, what one owes to life. Okay, now I'm in this form, I've come into this human form from wherever, and what is mine to do in life? What am I owed? You know, what, what, what is this? What is the preciousness of this human existence? And what am I, what do I owe back to life for 
you know, for, for having this life. And this is the word he uses for, ju for judge, but it's really more, as you say, it is more really like discriminate. Discriminate what is yours to do, what is not yours to do. You know, you have something that you owe to life. Okay, pay it. You know, but don't try to pay everyone's debt and don't try to, you know, convert somebody else to pay your so-called debt to life. And by life, I mean, you know, this preciousness of this existence that we have in these names and forms for for the breath, as long as the breath is in this flesh, as Jesus would call it. So it's it's all about that. Hmm. That's nice. Uh, I'm, I wouldn't have thought you'd interpret it that way or go into that from that comment, but um, there's definitely a feeling of um, giving back. You know, um, there's some there verse in, in the Indian tradition of thy gifts, my Lord, I surrender to thee. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like, if these are not mine, these gifts I have, they're there for, for me to pass on or to serve as an instrument of the divine. And the main thing is determining what is mine to do. I mean, Jesus could have stayed at home in Galilee and never gotten in trouble. Basically, yeah. he was pretty safe there. But he goes in Jerusalem, he throws, you know, he throws over the moneylenders tables and all this stuff, sets people and he didn't have to do, you know, he didn't have to, but he felt, okay, that's mine to do. So he did it. You know, and, and there you go. Sometimes you have to <laughs> upset people. <laughs> and Yeah, that's an interesting whole topic, too. I mean, one's dharma, you know, what is what, what is yep. mine to do? Um, and to what extent is are one's behaviors or actions motivated by sort of individual consciousness? And to what extent are they just an impulse of the divine for being channeled or uh, through one's individuality this um, is the whole journey of challenge of our lives yeah i mean as i see it yeah i mean the dean with the uh in the quran will just segue a little bit into quran the quran uses the same word as dean which is you could almost it's it's very similar to dharma really if you look at the way dharma is used uh, mystically so the dean is this you know what is what is mine what is really my path, mine to do? And unfortunately, in most translations of the Quran, this is translated as religion. So people think, oh, this is all about Islam or about some institutionalized form of Islam, but it's not. Um, you know, it's about finding your own, your own deen, your own way of proceeding, your own way in life, what, you, what, what is mine to do and what is my path. It doesn't mean you can't join with others, and it helps to join with others at some point, but at a certain point, probably not going to be. Yeah, I'm reminded here of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, let, if possible, let this cup pass from me, and then he yeah. says, after all, let thy will be done. Yeah. 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 Like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That must have been such a heavy, I mean, can you imagine yourself n knowing that you're going to be half beaten to death, beaten half to death and then crucified and yeah. on, on the eve of that and what you would have been feeling or yeah. going through? Yeah. yeah. So, some people have gone so far as to say that um, it, they, they distinguish between pain and suffering. And they, they you know, would say that, they have said that, you know, Jesus was at such a deep level that his, where while his body was experiencing pain, he was just residing in heavenly bliss deep within and, and wasn't actually suffering. Do you have any opinion about that? Um, I think it's very possible. Mm -hmm. I'm not there. <laughs> yeah, me neither. <laughs> so, so uh, but I, yeah, it's, it's certainly possible. Yeah. yeah. Because it's because it's such a fuss made in in Christianity about Jesus suffering, and there was that horrible yeah, oh, Mel yeah, Gibson movie, true. which I spared that myself the experience of seeing. That is true, and you yeah. know Jesus suffered for you, so you're going to suffer, and right, on and on. Some people interpret that as he took on a lot of karma, and if you if you connect yourself with him, then you become the beneficiary of some of the you know some of that uh, ab absolving of karma. Yeah, I think you know that's I have. I'm not so sure about that. I think Jesus was more about, as I was mentioning, you you have to find your own way, basically. He can help you at a certain point, but you go through him like a door, go through me like a door, and then keep going. Yeah. 
is um is god helps those who help themselves actually a passage in the bible or is that just a common saying i think that's a fairly common thing but not a biblical passage uh, i could be wrong yeah. i don't believe it's in the bible but i'm sure i'll be corrected by someone on the chat <laughs> okay good <laughs> Okay, here's a question from June Waterman in Midland, Michigan. Uh, what would be a good resource or book geared toward lay people about the most true or realistic representation of the ministry of Jesus? Well, <laughs> yours. <laughs> Mine, I, I, I have to be self serving and say, um, I think. Uh, Which of your books? Is, the one we're talking about here? Or yeah, The Revelations of the Aramaic Jesus. Okay. Um, I think that is a good place to start actually and uh yeah see if it makes sense to you that's all i can say yeah i thought it was good i liked it <clears throat> um it was funny because i used this uh voice translation software to turn written text into voice <laughs> so i can listen to it and you should have heard what it did with the aramaic but, <laughs> <laughs> but, was, but fortunately the passages are short so it's just like brief little pieces of gibberish <laughs> yeah okay um here's a question from uh Rizwati Freeman in Los Angeles. I'm wondering about the scripture in which Jesus tells a woman to go and sin no more after castigating the men who were chastising her. In other words, let him who was out without sin cast the first stone, that, that yep. event. Yep, yep, yep. <clears throat> yep, that's in the book too. So this is John 8, and um, you know, as, as the gospel says, they're trying to get Jesus in trouble, and so they bring him this, this woman who is supposedly uh, as it's usually translated, caught in adultery. And, uh, and what is usually overlooked is that Jesus says, um, Jesus starts writing something on the earth. This is in the Gospels. He starts writing something on the earth. It's the not sand, said yeah. what he is writing. Right. And then he says, let the one who is without their own tangles, which is about sin sin is in this case the word for tangles without your let the one who doesn't have their own tangled relationships or doesn't have tangled relationships in their path let them cast the first stone and so he's writing and writing and writing and then the gospel says that the people begin to sort of filter away the the ones who are the accusers and the oldest go out first now why does it say this well, this is speculation on my part, but I would speculate that the oldest have more tangled relationships and things in their past than the younger ones, and so they put down their stones first and they all, they all leave. And then Yeshua says to the woman, he says, well, you know, okay, you know, no one's, you know, no one has anything against you, no one owes anything against you, I don't owe anything against you. Again, he uses this word for usually translated as judge. So, you know, try not to get tangled in the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you make of, um, this is a bit of a curveball question, but what do you make of uh -huh. uh, the Christian political base in the U.S. who uh, will support people who are, you know, obviously dishonest and, you know, are, you know, adulterers and, and so on. Um, because they want to get Supreme Court justices appointed or just get their political party in power. And they really don't care how corrupt the politician is as long as they get their way in, in Washington. Um, I wonder what Jesus would have said about that. Jesus would not be pleased. Yeah. I mean, I was ranting to my wife about this last night as we were watching the U.S. election news and <laughs> saying, you don't know how bad it is, I told her. You know, you think Russia's bad um, because of the way the Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Church is in bed with Putin. You know, you've, this has been going on for generations in the U.S. from my experience, and it's just built to a head now where they can completely overlook, you know, all the things that you say um, because they believe somehow that God is going to rule the country their their image their limited image of god so to speak is going to rule the country in some way yeah. it's um it's delusion yeah well, it, anyway, it, it kind of reminds me of a house divided against itself cannot stand because i mean yes be, you get in, get into that verse just a little bit well again there's a similar thing in thomas too where he says remember this 
thing that we talked about about this only begottenness, this fully integrated human being where self and soul are turning easily from one to another, the heart is turning. So this is the fully integrated human being. This is where we want to be. And so it's all one, but the heart is turning easily. So, but the house divided, you know, you've got, you know, part of you over here and part of you over there and part of you doing this. And this can happen on the inner, you could say the so-called inner, as we now call it, or it can happen on the outer. We know one can be very divided in one's outer occupation, too much so, but one can also be very divided inside if one does not become more integrated, whole uh, on the inside. And again, just to, as a parenthetical, the word that's used for perfect uh, in Aramaic in the Gospels is this word to become whole or complete, not to be, you know, I don't know, according to some exterior standard, uh, perfect. So when Jesus said, be therefore perfect, he was saying be whole be complete. or complete. Yeah, be nice. fully complete and completing, because you're never really complete. It's just that you're complete in the moment, and then as life unfolds, this life unfolds, more completing will be required. <laughs> yeah. And of course, this house be, uh, the divided against itself cannot stand is within the context of Jesus being accused of... Um, the of satan giving him the powers that he had correct and he, and he said satan doesn't good do good stuff if satan's doing good stuff he, he can't stand because he's exactly counterproductive but uh, by yeah. the by the flip side of that is these politicians who are doing you know lying and cheating and stealing and you know corrupt in various ways um how can they be representatives of anything worthwhile <laughs> um it's like you know, th that won't stand. No, but, you know, this is, again, we see this happening with Christian, uh, some, some aspects of the Christian tradition, not all by any means, some aspects of Buddhism. Again, I mentioned Myanmar, some aspects of Hinduism. Yeah. Um, of course, Jewish religion. Uh, you can go on about this. It's, there's a, just as with the human self, there's a tendency now for, spirituality to be all sort of out here-ness. You know, it's all about the symbols, it's all about the trappings, it's all about how much control I feel I have over my external life, my so-called material life. Well, of course you, you want this, because the soul already has control of everything, but you're looking in the wrong place. The soul already has freedom and everything you're looking for, the rucha, but you know, you're looking to try to control this outer reality and it ain't for that. It's for learning how to turn back, yeah. you know, how to return. Hmm. Of course, this, this reminds me of the verse, you shall know them by their fruits. Um, yep. Yep. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Ripe or unripe, he says. You know, you know them by their, their ripe fruit or their unripe fruit. So, right. But there's, there's a lack of awareness of what unripe fruit is, it seems, in, uh, yeah. in the instances you're speaking of. Yeah, it seems like it should be common sense, but then sense isn't very common. No. Um, so here's a question from Jason Harms in Manhattan, Kansas. Um, thank you for sharing your insights, Neil. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. In your research, have you found that the original meanings of any of these translated texts support or do not support a non-dual understanding of existence? Yeah, I, I did mention this earlier in the talk. I'm not sure. Maybe it ran by people, but um, what you have is what you have is more of a view of, of not a split, splitness, not a two-ness, but a, a continuum, a polarity of all these qualities, self and soul, everything. And this continuum means that, okay, here I'm individual in this time space, and here I'm everywhere in all time. And then there's a place where they both come together. So it's like the North and the South Pole, the magnetic field of the two poles, it meets somewhere. And then it, in this middle, you have attraction from both. Similar also to what the Chinese tradition has is the, the yin and the yang. There's a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and then a dot in this and a dot in that. So it's more like this in the ancient Semitic languages. And so that makes the unity, you see. You could say that the yin and yang is dual, but it's not actually because it's, it's non-dual. It's just this is a way of viewing life so that you're not in denial and just in an abstract, so to speak, 
mental non-dualism that you know refuses to recognize what the needs of of this moment are and jesus was all about the moment that's an important point because a lot of modern non-dualists or neo-advaitans as they're called um have this sort of mental concept of it which they mistake for realization and um are do not give proper um uh, importance to the relative world and you know dismiss it as illusion and you know sure. continually continually emphasize that there's really no person and so on and so forth that it becomes very harmful for people that I, I did a, a interview with a woman named jessica eve a, a couple of months ago and that was a, our main focus was the the downside of um, mm. conceptual non-duality versus the yeah. genuine article and again one is led to a certain sort of passivity with that yeah uh -huh. where nihilism yeah and what's the use of doing anything and right exactly on and on yeah all right here's a question from aaron fish in london jesus said pluck out your eye or cut off your hand if they offend you as this is better than what you will experience in hell after you die not quite sure that's the way he said it, but the times yeah. Jesus the times Jesus talks about hell make it hard for me to reconcile what he was saying with the universal and compassionate God. Do you have any thoughts on this? Well, on <clears throat> on the hell bit, yes. Um, again, this is a reading of a Christian later Christian notion of hell back into the ancient Semitic afterlife, uh, which is, has nothing to do with this hell of of punishment actually and again even into the quran this notion survives that the afterlife is more like a the initial is a time of purification anything that the individual self is holding on to this is gradually for one of a better word purified sweated out of you can i say and then this the soul the in the eternal part of one's being travels further travels on and on and on so um, Jesus is, uses quite extreme language. Uh, and again, it depends on who he's speaking to when he tries to shock people. He does use shock therapy. He's like a Zen master. He uses some sort of shock phrases. Uh, but he's trying to point out that, you know, whatever you do here in so-called this life, this will have an effect on your experience of the afterlife. And they very definitely have an have a you know a feeling about the afterlife and that but there is mercy and compassion and there is time to purify and then for the soul you could say the individual self to be gradually dropped and then the soul to travel onwards if you will and that's just a very loose cosmology of ancient semitic mysticism there is a bit more in the book on that but speaking of the afterlife um and we mentioned you mentioned reincarnation earlier uh, some feel that um, reincarnation was part of early Christianity, but was edited out. Like Yogananda says, it was edited out at the Council of Nicaea. It, as you've been poking around in all these ancient things, have you come across it? Um, it's very possible. There are, you know, little bits of allusion to it throughout the Gospels. Because if you recall, there's one instance where Yeshua asks his students, well, who do people say I am? And then the students, the disciples, the students say, well, some people say you're, you know, you're Moses reborn. And some people say you're this person reborn. And Elijah so, or somebody. Or Elijah or yeah. like this. So if that, that notion was in the culture, that a, a particular being, a particular prophet could, or some quality of that prophet or some, some aspect of that prophet could be reborn in a in a in a body in a in a new body so to speak hmm. um, what does sufism make of reincarnation is it part of that sufi well again there's no one sufi point of view <laughs> on that and some well you know it's it's again similar i mean one of the great sufi teachers of the 20th century in khan once said the afterlife is like a like a recording and it plays the music we we created in life and so we're gonna at least at some point and this is early in the process as he imagines it we're going to hear this music that we created in our life is it great music is it harmonious music not so much or you know we're gonna it's going to be there and then we keep traveling further on 
And in, in Aya Khan, I don't think this is, a, this is necessarily a generally Sufi point of view, but Hazrat Naya Khan talks about that his cosmology, cosmogony, there are souls leaving and souls coming, and they exchange things, sort of like a Middle Eastern marketplace on the way. <laughs> and so Mozart's heading out, and somebody else is heading in, and yeah. Mozart says, hey, here, you can play the piano like me. So. And then it goes on like that. So um, I, again, I hope I'm not making this too. But I, th I think that's a rough paraphrase of what he talks about. Hmm. Well, who knows? Um, all right. Well, we've been going on for a pretty long time. And it's been a lot of fun. Are there any um, concluding thoughts that you want to leave us with or anything or even a song if you want to sing something? A song? Well, let me see if I still have a voice, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I'll... Um, I'll turn on original sound and I'll play you out with a little bit of the original one of these chants that came to me. Okay. What do you mean it came to you? Kind of cognized it or something? Um, well, all of the chants that go with this work, and people can find them on my website, they all happen on spiritual retreat. So this is an aspect we haven't talked about, but the uh, music as inspiration, you know, this is this is the way chants authentic could call chants that have a deep effect they come when they're being given so to speak in inspiration and so this came to me on a retreat um 40 years ago actually and it's the first line of jesus's prayer in aramaic and i heard a voice and the voice said well you know this isn't just for you share this with other people so i th i went home and i said to my wife well you know, my crazy, you know, what's going on here? So she said, well, let's just try it, you know, see what happens. You know, that's all you just try it and see what happens. So that since then, a lot of this is, has spread. And a lot of groups do this set of chanting now along with Taizé music or other chanting or interfaith chanting, things like that. So anyway, this is the first line of Jesus's prayer. And the words are Avun Deba, oops, Shemaya. And I'm going to have to, for your engineer here. Almost sounds like Om Namah Shivaya, which is a it does, Hindu. Yeah, Avun yeah. is a bit like Om. Yeah. And Shamaya is a bit like Shivaya, but it's got these, the oohs and the ah sounds. Mm -hmm. So this is the sound of the first line, which is usually translated, Our Father, which art in heaven, which is, as I already mentioned, not that at all. There's no in. There's like this reality is moving to and from the reality that is in space and light and all around us so let's just do a wee bit of that <clears throat> Shema, 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 Shema,
Very nice. Thank you. Nice guitar work, too. You weren't even looking. You had your eyes closed the whole time. Yeah. Takes practice. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. I've um, really, the dog is coughing down here. I've really <laughs> enjoyed uh, this whole conversation and uh, getting to know you and, um, you know, reading your book and all. And I'll be, um, I've, I've already created a, a web page on that gap for your interview, which I'll post when you when I get your interview ready to post and it contains links to um, several of your books and also to your author page on Amazon which lists all of your books so people can go, and also to your website um, so fabulous yeah thank you Good. thank you Rick oh you're welcome best wishes to you and your work and your continued helping people find their way through all these wonderful interviews yeah it's a joy um, and I'm the prime beneficiary you know I mean you just it helps. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure it changes you too. It really does. It's a kind of a, a powerful technique. Yeah. I, I'm usually high as a kite all day after I do an interview. That's <laughs> <laughs> how it should be. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Great. And thanks to those okay. who are listening or watching. And um, my next guest is going to be a very dear friend of mine named Robin Charasia, who lives in, uh, well, at the moment she's in London, but um, she's spent a lot of time in the Himalayas. But long story with Robin, but she, her primary thing that she's been doing in, in recent years is uh, helping children who are born in the red light district of Mumbai get out of there and get a good education and um, live a good life. And she's knocking herself out, helping people all over the world in the, in the midst of, or in the face of daunting obstacles and challenges, such as getting beat up by corrupt policemen and you know, all kinds of uh, horrible things that she's had to face. But I, I just love her so much for what she's doing. And um, anyway, that, that'll be my next interview. So stay tuned. <laughs>